Hello, everyone. This is Spencer from Hydromantis, and uh, Happy New Year, and welcome to the first of our webinar series for 2021. So today we're going to be talking about modeling oxidation ditch processes, and specifically, I'm going to do that in the context of talking about setting up uh, biological nutrient removal systems. Uh, you know, in particular, those that do nitrification and denitrification. And so um, uh, there's a lot of really interesting things that you can do and different types of control systems that you can put in there. So we'll, we'll do a, a little bit of that uh, today. Okay, let's move the slides along. There we go. My name is Spencer Snowling. I'm VP of Product Development here at Hydromantis, and as per usual, and I'm sure many of you are as well, working from home these days. Uh, here's my setup with my fancy podcaster microphone, and uh, so I'm glad that we're able to continue to do the podcast series. We've actually had really great attendance. Uh, some of the best, uh, most highly attended webinars we've ever had have been during uh, this COVID time where everybody's working from home. So I'm glad that you're able to join us uh, on a regular basis. Um, as per usual, by the way, uh, I'm going to stick around at the end and answer any questions that you might have. So um, as the webinar is going along, feel free to type questions into the questions box that is part of your GoToWebinar dashboard. Uh, we'll wait till we get to the very end and then we'll scroll through and I'll stick around and answer as many as I can of those and then follow up with other ones uh, afterwards. So uh, speaking of our webinars, I just wanted to acknowledge one little interesting tidbit. I noticed when I set out to put the webinar together uh, for today, um, today is exactly the 10th anniversary of the first webinar that we ever did, <laughs> uh, just by coincidence, 10, 10 years to the day. And uh, so back then we used to do them, uh, they were actually much shorter, only 10 or 15 minutes long, and they were a little bit more frequent. So we kind of evolved them into this once a month, sort of 45 minutes to hour type webinars that we have now. So anyway, I'd like to thank you all for um, uh, you know responding to that and for participating and, and giving us lots of really great engagement in, in the webinars themselves and asking us really great questions uh, and being part of that uh, over the time that we've been doing this. And we, can, we hope to continue to do that and elaborate on it and break, branch out into some other new areas with our webinars um, in the near future. Okay, so for today, uh, what we're going to do is, well, I'll talk a little bit at the beginning about um, activated sludge oxidation ditch or carousel, as it's uh, sometimes also known, uh, the design and sort of uh, the important parts of those activated sludge designs when it comes to putting your model together and predicting how that performance is, is going to be done. Uh, so we'll talk about the oxidation ditch unit process model in GPSX, and we'll open up the menus and talk about all the important things that you need to pay attention to. And we'll talk about specifically setting things up for BNR systems. Uh, so that's things like making sure you have the right type of uh, ditch velocity going around and where you set up your aeration and some of the things that you need to know for that. Uh, I have a couple demonstrations uh, ready to go, talk a little bit about a case study for a real plant that we did, and then uh, wind, wind things up. And then, as I mentioned, I'll stick around to answer um, some questions at the end. So feel free to put those questions in the questions box. Okay, so uh, you've probably seen an oxidation ditch uh, at somewhere along uh, your journeys, possibly. They are actually quite popular, particularly in North America. And they look like this one here. This is an Envirodyne system version. It's a, this is a pretty simple one. So we, we obviously have a flow moving around this and it's sort of a long plug flow system that uh, where the flow uh, comes into this and uh, exits out through an effluent port. But in the meantime, most of the flow moves around. In this particular case, it's in a clockwise fashion. And uh, they often have surface aerators. And so here we can see these surface brush aerators are uh, stirring up that surface, throwing that uh, water around and then training it like a surface aerator does and training some oxygen bubbles in there. Uh, you can see it's quite a lot of turbulence, for example, on this side here as it goes around. And of course, as that oxygen is consumed and so on, the dissolved oxygen kind of comes down as it's being consumed by the biomass and it goes around and then it meets another aerator and then it's high again on that side and it comes back around again. So they're actually pretty uh, flexible in what you can do with them. And they're often configured to do a fairly advanced uh, biological nutrient removal. So there are varying levels of complexity of these systems. Uh, this is an orbital system, and that's one where we have sort of 
concentric rings uh, of oxidation ditch. So uh, can kind of uh, uh, come through, be fed into the middle and go around through various types of zones and through outwards as it goes on to, and then effluent out to the other part of the plant. Um, these are designed very specifically to have, you know, aerobic zones and oxic zones and recycles that allow flow from certain parts of that uh, ring system to go to other parts so that we can have recycled um, nitrified recycle go back into some areas where it can do denitrification. And they can be configured for obviously for biological uh, nutrient removal if you have all of your zones set up properly and you're able to manage your um, aeration well. Now typically, not always, but typically oxidation ditches are the kind of system you might operate without primary clarifiers. So you just have screened influent coming straight in. And on the most part, they tend to have longer SRTs. They're often fairly um, large systems. So in a way, they're, they're, they're basically an extended air system, but with lots of interesting flexibility that you can, you can put into it. So this is a... Um, uh, OxyStream version of that same thing. And this is where you can sort of supplement the actual oxidation uh, ditch system with some uh, other zones around uh, the tank before and after that you can exchange some flow with. So uh, in these types of systems, for example, the, the you can see, of course, here, there's no primary clarifiers at this particular plant. So the, the influent comes in and the RAS coming back from the secondary clarifiers can come into this mixed anoxic, uh, pre-anoxic zone here at the front and then into the channels and uh, goes around through this long pathway. Um, uh, but then even after that's done, there's a post-anoxic zone available here and another little aerated zone. So there's um, opportunities to do actually quite sophisticated um, uh, BNR type systems by just the way that they're laid out. And the fact that you've got sort of these long zones going back and forth, um, it gives you an opportunity to, to put a bit of a controlled system and even exchange. I've seen some systems where they exchange some of the uh, the stuff that's just finishing its trip through the aerated zone back into the pre-anoxic zone again. So um, uh, lots of interesting ways. So that makes it something that's really good and interesting to model because our models are able to do, you know, the, the strength of the kind of modeling that we do is to be able to capture the different biological reactions that are happening under those different conditions. So um, that's what sort of gives you the value of the information you can get out of the model. There are other types of oxidation systems where they can have, you know, typical disk surface aerators or diffused aeration systems submerged. Uh, but typically the most common uh, aeration system is these brush aerators with those sort of bristles or so to speak that rotate around at a very high speed and they throw the water around and entrain that air, air into it. And so the other purpose of those is to actually push the flow along through the ditch and to continue to keep the velocity up and move that, uh, move that water around. Keeping your velocity up is actually a bit of a key feature in a lot of these systems. You need to um, keep the solids from uh, settling out. So you need to keep the solids suspended and often you should be looking at and Metcalf and Eddie here, I looked it up today, uh, recommends, you know, around one foot per second to sort of keep those things um, moving along, keep that flow going so that you don't allow the mixed liquor to settle out. So as I mentioned, they're typically acting es essentially as an extended aeration system but with flexible zones for a BNR. And of course, because you're aerating in one place and that air, that oxygen kind of gets dragged along and then used up at the same time, it just by its own nature sort of develops its own combination of aerated zones and anoxic zones and so on. But upon that, um, many uh, opportunities exist to build sophisticated aeration control systems to kind of optimize the, the relative size of those zones and the amount of air that's being supplied, for example, to, truly, to really try and optimize that simultaneous nitrification and denitrification and also, um, you know, it just in general, make it more robust and optimize the energy usage in your particular plant. Okay, so oxidation ditches are interesting and, and, and plentiful, so we want to understand how to model them. So we have an oxidation ditch object in GPSX. If you open the suspended growth processes panel and scroll all the way to the bottom, it's the one at the end, looks like this. Uh, and it has three connection points. So the influent uh, is the flow that would be coming from the head of the plant or whatever, uh, you know, after screening or whatever you may have. Uh, the recycle is your RAS coming back in and then the effluent coming out from the ditch itself uh, comes out to the right-hand side, and then you can connect that on and, and move it down to the next unit in your system. 
Now, the way we model it is with CSTRs in series. And by default, we use 16 CSTRs in series to model a plant. It tends to work pretty well. Um, that's the number that over the years we've discovered seems to be the most um, typical and, and, and works the best. If for some reason you absolutely need to use some other number, uh, send me an email. I can show you how to do that as well. But by general, I always encourage people to use the 16 that we have and it almost always works uh, very nicely. So what you need to do is specify the total volume and the length of that ditch and, the, uh, and specify the, the ditch velocity of the flow moving around and, uh, and the details of the aeration. So in each of those 16 CSTRs, we're gonna be using the regular biological model that you want to use. Now I, I've suggested here using Mantis 2. Uh, that's the default one that you'll get if you if you start up GPSX and start putting things on the drawing board. But we do have the oxidation ditch object available in our other libraries as well. So you can do the greenhouse gas carbon footprint modeling uh, in an oxidation ditch uh, as well. We also have it available for our uh, uh, sulfur and selenium library and also I believe in our industrial library as well. So. Um, so it's available there. Whatever library you have chosen for the biological reactions, uh, we will be doing the modeling with that particular set of equations. So when you open up the physical menu, you will see the opportunity to set the uh, volume. I usually set the total volume and the volume fractions, and I make all of the individual parts of those 16 uh, equal to each other. That seems to be uh, my experience, the best way to do it. If for some reason you need to do it differently, you could set individual cell volumes uh, via the other menu item just uh, right below here. And now getting on to the operational parameters, and there's quite a bit of stuff that you'll need to specify here. First of all, we need to set um, the details, which is the location of where the flow is coming in in the carousel relative to where it's going out. And also that is the same for the RAS if those two things happen to be different. Um, uh, we also need to set the ditch velocity, and you can actually do that via several different methods, but typically we do that via a velocity setting. Um, you can actually specify the flow as a flow rate directly if you like, and uh, so you can set that, and then the details of the aeration. And actually this menu continues on further down for different types of aeration systems. Now, uh, you can use a DO controller, just like you can with any of our other activated sludge units. Uh, however, I, for the example that I'm going to be showing you for the most part today, uh, I'll be using that, that brush aerator uh, type of mechanical aeration system and without a DO controller on, at least in the beginning. Uh, and uh, we're just going to set a specific power setting um, for the rotation of those brushes. So, uh, uh, yep, that's actually right here. Uh, it's a little farther down the menu. Uh, that's what it looks like. You would click on this button and you can specify in all of the different units all the way around the ditch uh, what the rotation of that particular aerator is. So the first thing that I mentioned there was that you need to specify the location of where the flow goes in and out. And this is actually something that is a little bit maybe not intuitive until you, you do it the first time. Uh, basically, we number these from 1 to 16 in this kind of a manner, right? So let's, uh, for argument's sake, say that the flow is going to go clockwise around in this um, oxidation ditch here. And you can see we have uh, these 16 individual reactors. One key part is that the effluent always by default comes out of reactor number 16. So by default, it has to come out of number 16. All of the other things that you can set can be set relative to that. So for example, here I'm showing that uh, the flow comes into reactor number eight and it leaves through 16, right? So that means that in the menus, I would need to specify that I wanted my influent coming in here and my RAS coming into uh, zone number eight. Now there's, I've worked on quite a few oxidation ditch projects over the years and I've seen so many different configurations. Many of them are actually the inlet is right next to where the outlet is. Sometimes it comes in the side. It depends on what your system is. We have the opportunity to set that up here by going to the top of the aeration, sorry, the operational menu, um, clicking on the influent button and then setting this. Now this is a fraction, meaning from zero to one. And right now it'll show you by default, it's all going into zone number one. Well, that's not what I'm showing here. I would actually put that to zero and then set zone number eight 
to have a value of one, meaning that all of the flow is going in there. And again, the same thing for the recycle, if that's the way I wanted to configure it. <clears throat> so pin down your system with the end, with the effluent number 16, and then figure out where your influent comes in from there. Okay, so for the aeration settings, it's um, uh, just a case of figuring out where your aerators are located relative to the numbering system that we've uh, specified here. So this is sort of <laughs> my best attempt at a drawing of a brush aerator in uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> Actually came out much better than I expected. Uh, and uh, you can just locate that wherever it is that it works in your particular system. And, and so for the example that I was showing in that, uh, that uh, image earlier, um, it was an aerator that was located across both of the lanes, aerating it going in one direction on one side and uh, the other direction on the other side. So for example here, what you would see is that we should then specify for this example that we have uh, power turned on and aeration happening in zones four and 13. So I would, um, and some other configurations, you can do it in multiple configurations as well. If you have some, this is also another common configuration that I've worked with. This would be showing uh, aeration in zones three, six, 11, and 14. And so you would uh, open up your menu and you would specify those things accordingly by looking at uh, the index along the side here. And you would specify zero and all the ones that are not being aerated and then whatever power you want to specify in the ones that actually are being aerated. So again, it's all with respect to the effluent side. Okay, so when you're setting the ditch velocity, which is also in that operational menu, um, one thing that we've learned over the years is that it's often um, uh, a overestimating if you were to just use a surface velocity measurement. So if you had a, a little velocity meter, or I've also seen lots of uh, people use floats, uh, just put something in there, let it take one trip all the way around, time it, and then figure out what velocity that was to take one trip all the way around the ring. <coughs> um, that often overestimates the true velocity of the entire depth of the flow. So quite frequently, you might want to put in something that is less than what you would measure at the surface. Um, and so uh, we've had much uh, success with that over the years. So, um, and in fact, I, you know, ditch velocity can be a little bit of a calibration parameter. You might adjust it to make sure that you get the right, um, uh, you know, distribution of aerated and anoxic zones, because, you know, you want to get the, the, the representative average ditch velocity across the entire depth of, of this uh, tank. So this is uh, sort of a schematic of, of the sort of the general concept of open channel flow where, where uh, at the surface uh, in an open channel with no friction along the top because it's open to the atmosphere, you would have the highest velocities at the top and lower velocities down against uh, the sides of the channel or against the bottom of the channel. Um, and you know, particularly if you had like other things in here, mixers and whatnot, um, that could be extremely site specific. But for the most part, um, if you took a measurement right along the top here, that would be the, the maximum possible velocity that would be in there. So we recommend setting, because you want to represent the entire thing, something partway through, so like half or uh, a third or whatever. Okay, so let's take a look at some uh, desktop demonstrations here. Okay, here's GPSX. Uh, I made a couple small, simple layouts. <coughs> we have actually a sample layout for oxidation ditches, which is what I actually based this off of. So if you want to dig into a little bit more details, you can go take a look at that one uh, afterwards. But for now, I'll show you uh, what this looks like. Uh, okay, before we go into simulations, I'll open up this menu and I'll show you how that kind of fit for Oh, you know what? I, I jumped the gun a little bit. I wanted to show you this slide first. This is what I'm actually simulating. Is in this case that, that same sort of configuration that I was showing you for before, with one uh, aerator all the way across, so it covers zones four and three. Uh, sorry, four and thirteen, and our inlet, uh, our influent flow, and our rasp are both coming into zone eight, and the flow goes this direction around. Uh, okay, so what that looked like when I want to actually do that in uh, GPSX, I open up this menu, I've specified some uh, details here about its size, and let's go to the operational menu. This is the, where the, the most important part is. Now I've got that mechanical uh, section here, 
And if I click on the aeration power, we can see I've set everything to zero except for four and 13, where I have uh, 30 horsepower listed there. So that illustrates and tells GPSX where are your brushes located with respect to all the other parts of that system. I'll also show you here that we are uh, locating in zone eight, um, the influent flow that's coming into that system. Okay, so that's at a minimum, the number of things that you would want to be able to specify when that runs. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. Um, I'm gonna run it for steady state followed by uh, 10 days. Now, one thing that you'll notice right off the bat, and I have some slides coming on this, is that um, the oxidation ditch uh, actually doesn't play nicely with our steady state solver. Actually, the reason behind it is, is that really big internal recycle. It's like a long plug flow tank with a recycle from the back for, to the front. <clears throat> so as I'll show you here, um, when we uh, go through the tips on how to set things up, sometimes, you'll find that it has to take many kicks at the steady state solver to get through to the final answer. So sometimes we wanna bump up some of the settings in the steady state solver in order to make that work. So don't be afraid that if you see that um, it struggles with convergence, that's actually quite typical for an oxidation ditch. And ultimately what we solve for in the end is still a, a quite a fine answer. It's just that it uh, works on a different scale. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you then is, I, uh, when I'm just halted this briefly so we can take a look at these ditch profiles. <clears throat> now this is where I find the really interesting part uh, is to look through. Um, so if you remember, I'm just gonna throw that slide up just one more time real quick. The aeration is happening in zones four and 13 and the inlet and uh, the influent flows coming into eight. Okay, <clears throat> so the way the oxidation ditch has been solved is it's showing that uh, it has, you know, different concentrations through all of the different zones based on the, the BNR activity. Here's dissolved oxygen. So here's four. So, and it, you know, it's aerating enough in that particular system to get over one milligram per liter of DO in zone four. And then very quickly it drops off. So we're really only aerating in four and 13. And you can see the DO drops off all the way down to 0.2 before it hits the next zone. So basically, as the as it went down and around the end of the oxidation ditch and it came back down the other side and then it hits that next aerator, bumps back up again and it comes down. And of course, this wraps around over here and comes back down again and so on. But all the flow that's leaving is actually leaving from this concentration from this last zone 16 reactor. So um, it, it gives you a, a, quite a lot of information to look at how this profile is showing you. How fast is this drop off? How fast is this drop off with respect to when it leaves the tank? What if the effluent was taken from a different place? What if we located the aeration in a different place? There's lots of really fascinating stuff that you can that you can put in here. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the ammonia here, since it's, it, this is actually an ammonia of 0.2 something, so it's you know fully nitrifying. Uh, but you'll notice here that it's actually the highest um, in zone eight. That is because that's where the influent is coming in. So we can see that makes sense to us and it gets uh, fully nitrified as it's going all the way around the system with all of this oxygen up here. And then it hits the influent again. And then of course it's mixing and diluting with the flow that's coming in from the influent. Okay, so I also threw up nitrate, sorry, nitrite and nitrate on this system as well. And it's interesting to see what happens. So I'm gonna continue on. If I, if I start making changes to this system, like what if I was to really knock back the uh, aeration to just five horsepower? You know, immediately we can see, well, we're, now we're not in the nitrifying anymore, right? <clears throat> we have barely just a little, a little dribble of residual DO there. So, okay, let's put it back up to say 15. And um, yeah, it comes back a little bit. And, and in fact, you can probably find a nice little spot around 10 there or so where this almost gets all the way back down to zero before it hits the next aerator. And actually our, our residual nitrate is really, really low here because of course we're doing uh, a lot of simultaneous nitrification and denitrification. Our model actually captures that behavior really well because now we've got this, these, this fairly significant zone here where it's less than one. It's like 0.5 or less here. So there's lots of room. Um, you know, especially right around where the influent is coming in here, bringing in all that nice carbon available for denitrification. So this is a real good spot here to do some, some denitrification. And you can see here, now if I was to really go the other way, let's put this at like 60. <clears throat> 
and uh, continue this again. Um, you know, eventually you'll see, yeah, well, I got lots of aeration. Now I don't have those anoxic zones. My nitrite, sorry, nitrate came way back up again. So it was actually a little bit more efficient before when we were kind of starving it off a little bit. So uh, so those are really interesting aspects um, uh, of, of that. I'm gonna reset this all back again. And I wanna do one more thing. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the ditch velocity. So, um, you know, if I was to really ramp that up again, uh, let's go uh, much faster. You can see that, of course, it's now acting much more like a completely mixed system. And so we don't have those nice anoxic zones there because we're dragging all that oxygen all the way down and it's not even have time to get used up before we get to the next aer aeration system. So, so that can also be something that, um, you know, could be a consideration for for your um, your system as well. Uh, okay, so those are lots of really interesting things that you can do with your oxidation ditch model just by looking at the profiles of the oxygen, your substrate, your nutrients, uh, you know, nitrogen forms and phosphorus forms, especially if the whole point of your system is to really optimize that, uh, that BNR. Here's the nice visual way to make that happen. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. So as I mentioned, the steady state solver can uh, struggle a little bit with oxidation ditches. The reason for that is that it's uh, that large internal recycle makes it pretty, uh, the model pretty bouncy when you're trying to tighten up that convergence. And so we have a damping factor here. Uh, if you go to the, uh, you know, right click in the background and go to input parameters and then system and then steady state solver settings, um, first of all, there's two things you should do. One is that you should increase the termination criteria. Um, uh, that is allowing you to sort of say to the model, you know, this is uh, the point at which I want to say this answer is good enough. And for oxidation ditches, you know, we don't need to go all the way down to 10 because uh, we have 16 reactors to start with. That's 16 times as many tanks as you would normally have. Um, so especially if you have several oxidation ditches in your layout. Um, so we don't need to get all the way down that low. Um, and just by running a little dynamic simulation, you can just let a, any other residual dynamics kind of settle themselves out to, to reach equilibrium. I do recommend bumping up the number of retries on iteration. It's, it's three by default. I'd say put it at six or eight or something, um, just to make sure it gets enough kicks uh, at, at the can before it gives up uh, if it tries to. Um, and lastly, if you're really struggling after that, hit this uh, this more button right here and you'll get this menu put on the damping factor uh, up from one up to five. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make any difference, but sometimes it will help. Okay, so now what I would like to do is talk a little bit about doing some more of those uh, sort of more advanced um, oxidation ditch BNR type processes where we want to do something a little bit beyond um, just aerating in one spot and you know with a consistent airflow or consistent power. So what you can do is you can take the model that like the one that I was just showing and you can combine that with the PID or timer or on-off process controllers that are available in the process control panel on the left hand side of your drawing board. So by there, what we can do is we can actually take a look at a signal somewhere in this system, and we could there's lots of different things we could choose to do. Uh, but let's say, for example, I could look at total nitrogen in the effluent, I could look at ammonia in the effluent, and then I could apply one or more of these controls uh, to various aspects of the aeration. So I could say when the, uh, when the ammonia gets too high, I want to increase the amount of aeration. Or when it gets too low, um, that means I'm probably wasting a lot of aeration, so let's back it off. And so um, that can be either done uh, through changing your power or bringing other things online and offline. And I, I'm, uh, the case study that I'll show you at the end of the webinar today does that. Right, okay, so let's take a look at, for example, what it would look like if we did an on-off ammonia controller. And I don't, uh, we use the term on-off in GPSX, but really it's high-low. Basically, it is when we hit an upper bound, I want to use one parameter on the input. And when we hit the lower bound, I want you to switch to the lower parameter. All it really does is basically just keeps things within one particular upper and lower bound. So you have to set a number of things in that menu. And so this is a screenshot of the one that I'm uh, going to be showing you here. 
<clears throat> basically what we're saying is in this, I want to control effluent ammonia. That's just the cryptic variable name for effluent ammonia. And I want to keep it between a high of uh, 0.5 milligrams per liter and a low of 0.25. And I'm going to do that by adjusting the airflow. So in this particular case, I'm going to be using airflow rather than power um, that for that particular example that I set up. <clears throat> and these are the airflow settings that I want to use. So when I hit the low limit, uh, you know, it's going to have a, a, a lower flow. When it hits the high limit, it's going to have a higher flow. When I when there's more ammonia coming out the effluent, it's time, it's time to turn on more air. That's the way to think about it. Now, you could actually, <coughs> excuse me, um, even uh, link these things together and make yourself uh, a multi-step cascade controller if you like. Um, and in fact, we did a whole webinar on that called Implementing Advanced Pro Process Control in GPSX, where we did ABAC control and AVN and a bunch of other things that are, you know, places where you're taking a bit more sophisticated approach and you can use these kinds of objects on your drawing board to link them together and do that. So I I uh, recommend uh, going to our YouTube channel and taking a look at that one. It's more or less what I'm, what I'm going to be doing here. Okay, so let's uh, do that. And I'm going to go to my other example. <clears throat> so here it is, as uh, I said before, um, we go in here, we open up this menu, we specify those details. Now I've gone in and worked out all of that already ahead of time here, and I'm just gonna pop over and run the simulation. <clears throat> so uh, what, I'm gonna what you're gonna see here is, it's gonna come to steady state first, and then what you'll see is the upper and lower limit plotted up here along with the actual effluent ammonia. And down here, <clears throat> you'll see the airflow that is being controlled by this controller. So what's happening is when the effluent ammonia in black goes above the upper limit, it pops up to the high flow rate. And when it falls down below the lower limit, it drops down to the lower flow rate. And this is a typical high-low or on-off type controller. And we can see here that um, uh, the oxidation ditch is basically turning the air into a high setting and a low setting back and forth completely in response to what's going on in the system. Now, it's kind of worked itself out into this sort of uh, wavelength of about three quarters of a day here. And um, uh, and we could actually do this under all sorts of different loading settings, and we could make these high, low, um, uh, you know, um, upper and lower bounds to be whatever it is that we want to control, and so on. There's lots of really interesting aspects that you can do here. So um, if we wanted to go into the next step of... Um, uh, doing an ABAC controller, we could we could have the high-low um, settings here, not control airflow directly, but actually have it uh, control the DO set point, and then have the DO controller control the airflow. And so that becomes that sort of two-step cascade process. However, uh, I'm going to show you this. I'm, I'm going to run it one more time because it's actually really interesting to watch the profiles that you know we were watching in the previous um, uh, menu here, we can see that, when, well, when the air comes on and then we got lots of air, um, uh, you know, the nitrate goes way up because now we're fully nitrifying. When the air goes off, so when these, these red bars come down, the ammonia pops up and then the nitrate goes down because, of course, now we're in an anoxic period. And so we can actually denitrify away all that. So you kind of get this uh, sort of... Uh, breathing pattern here as it goes back and forth between uh, its aerobic section and its anoxic section. And uh, that's totally controlled by those, uh, by the behavior in the effluent. So uh, really interesting thing to do uh, and, and really interesting um, aspects to play with in your, in your process control. Now, of course, I'm doing that for a completely constant influent. If we had other dynamics happening in our influent even more so, that would be really fascinating to play around with. <clears throat> Okay, so as I mentioned, I really recommend going back and taking that, a look at that uh, um, webinar on advanced process control that we did, I believe it was in July. So if you go to youtube.com slash hydromantis, you can find our uh, video of that as well. Okay, how am I doing for time here? All right, uh, pretty good. Okay, so the last thing I want to do before we uh, get into answering some questions is to talk about um, an example. This is an example of a very similar kind of thing that we did uh, uh, work on just this past year. So uh, this is a plant in Green Valley, uh, uh, sorry, the Green Valley plant in Pima, Cara, Pima County, Arizona. 
and we it has an oxidation ditch and so we did some modeling for them what you're actually looking at right now is a simuworks interface simuworks is a interface that we can put on our gpsx models that allows the um, users to use it in a very simple and straightforward way so uh, but it makes for a really nice diagram that i want to use to explain how um, we modeled the control system for this bnr oxidation ditch so in this particular case, if you look at this diagram, you can see, first of all, the water flows around here in a clockwise kind of direction. There's those blue arrows kind of indicating that. And you can see that these here, R1, R2, and R3, and R4, represent the surface aerating aeration systems, those four rotors as they are around the system. Now they operate independently of each other, even the ones that are across from each other, they're, they're separate and they can turn on and off at different times. And so what the system does is it has um, uh, these four uh, rotors connected to a DO control system. And what the DO control does is it takes the average DO reading from two different sensors here in the middle of the system. So in tanks five and 12. Then what happens is the uh, you can take uh, these rotors in and out of service independently. You can turn them on and off separate from each other. And they have a very interesting setup here where if the DO that's in the tank, that average DO in those two tanks, is greater than the set point that they have set, uh, that turns off the rotor that has already been running the longest. And if it's less than, then they turn on the, rotator, the, the rotor that has been running the least. And so um, if I just kind of like move through this aeration here, you can see rotors coming on and the DO set point, uh, sorry, the DO is coming up and then it passes um, the set point now, it's actually higher than the 0.4 set point. So it takes one rotor off and then puts another one on and so on. So it's a nice way to sort of see um, visually how that can be done. And when you put that into the GPSX model, you can see how it changes the profile and you can see what the effect is of that kind of an implementation. So we, so via those methods that I was just showing you, we built this uh, model for this particular system. So um, I did a little separate case study, separate, um, uh, and this was actually part of a uh, webinar that uh, I did last summer uh, that was discussing denitrification. And uh, I just wanted to run through and run a number of different scenarios with the model. And we came up with some interesting uh, ways to look at it. So. If we were to run with all four rotors on all the time, uh, that's sort of our baseline case, and we were to run that particular plant, um, the average air rater on time, so if they're on all the time, 24 hours a day, uh, we get an average DO of 1.6 milligrams per liter, and the effluent TN, um, total nitrogen, is 33. Now, of course, it's very high. It's 33 because we're not doing any denitrification. It's all aerated all the time. And we can see here that uh, there's their cost of almost $150,000 per year. So if you do the same thing, but turn one rotor off, but leave the other three on all the time, then you'll find, of course, that we have 18 hours a day. Uh, our DO is less because, of course, we're not aerating as much. Uh, the residual is 0.5, um, and our effluent TN drops by about half almost. So, uh, you know, that's now allowing sort of one long piece of that uh, uh, oxidation ditch pathway to be anoxic and have access to some carbon so it's doing denitrification and save some money of course we're aerating less so then if we went into that do control system that i was showing you where things are coming on and going off and so on uh we then have um uh, these uh do control of of a total of uh, sorry, sorry setting the do set point at 0.6 the average DO sort of revolves in and around that 0.6 section. Um, and we have a, a, an aerator on time of 16 hours and then uh, saving a little bit more money and our effluent TN dropped again now because we're now getting into the zone. When, we, when, our, when our DO is down here around half a milligram per liter, we're getting to that point where we're doing really efficient uh, simultaneous nitrification, denitrification. So we then have DO of 0.2. And so that goes a little bit too low. Right now we can see here that the effluent TN has come back up again. So that means that we're actually not nitrifying enough. Now we save a lot of money because we're not, we're not aerating there nearly as much. And actually what we did was we worked out that the, for this particular example, the, uh, uh, the DO control at 0.375 milligrams per liter is the one that gives us sort of the most optimal setting where we can uh, still save a lot of money, but it gets us the lowest effluent uh, total nitrogen. Okay, so that was an interesting uh, little sort of uh, uh, experiment. 
Um, and just to summarize a few thoughts from today's webinar, these oxidation ditches are really a very interestingly complex system that really does allow for a lot of flexibility in operation, both in the terms of the way you can arrange your recycles, and especially if you have those pre and post anox anoxic zones where you can recycle some of that flow from the ditch to them and back again. Uh, they can certainly be very successfully modeled using CSTRs in series, and you can really combine them to do uh, very interesting process control uh, and doing a lot of optimization for BNR systems.